walking through the portals of heaven. And the angel asked Jesus, said, what is your plan of salvation? How do you intend to save all of lost humanity? And Jesus said, in response to the angel, he said, well, he said, one man will be saved, and then one man, that one man will tell another man who will be saved, and then that man will tell another, and, and another, and another, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And the angel responded to Jesus, you mean it is really that simple? Well, what is your backup plan in case that doesn't work? And the response to Jesus to the angel in the, in the fable was, I have no backup plan. And when you think about the Gospels, you think about what we often refer to as the synoptic Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Each one of them concludes the Gospel or their particular Gospel with this plan that Jesus just in the fable described to the angel. Matthew's account of the Great Commission is, make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. In Mark's account, he puts it this way in Mark 16 and verse 15, preach the gospel to every creature. The next verse says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who believes not will be condemned. In Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 24, the commission is, some, is worded somewhat differently, but nevertheless it's the same. Verse 47, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now the verses that were read by Logan out of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, is the beginning of that commission. It's the beginning of, uh, uh, of this commission being carried throughout the world. And this is exactly what we see throughout the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 28 and verse 31, which is kind of reminds me of Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, in that verse we find that Paul is now in the city of Rome and what he's doing is preaching the kingdom of God and teaching people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in our study today, and what I want us to do as we begin this study this morning is I want every one of us to take hold of a Bible and I want to look at a particular chapter in the Bible. Now you can take a Bible that is, uh, you know, the old traditional book kind or if you have an electronic Bible, get it out. Because what I want us to do is all of us in our Bibles this morning, I want us to turn to Acts chapter 29. And I want you to raise your hand when you get to Acts chapter 29. Yeah, we're going to take our study from Acts 29 and we're going to entitle it, The Story Continues. Well, you say, J.R., there is no Acts 29. Well, that's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, the book of Acts ends with Acts 28 and verse 31 with Paul in the city of Rome preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But if you ever notice how that chapter ends, it almost doesn't end. It almost seems as though there should be this little line underneath of that that says to be continued. And this is what I've always found very interesting about the book of Acts. We say that it's really a history of the spread of Christianity in the first century, and that's true. But really what we see here is an incompleted story. It, it's something that seems like it should go on and on and on. Because in reality, ladies and gentlemen, the book of Acts has not ceased. Oh yes, it ended in Acts chapter 28. I grant you that. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to lay down his pen of inspiration and the book closed. But in reality, the Great Commission continues on. The Great Commission continues on from generation to generation to generation. And ever since, ever since Acts chapter 28 concluded the book of Acts, it has been expected that every subsequent generation, as it were, not literally, but as it were, add to the book of Acts. And this is what I want us to think about. We need to be continuing because the commission has been passed on to every generation. Now I want you to think about some things. As we, can, as we consider the spread of Christianity in the first century, I want us to remember something. I want us to remember as the book of Acts begins in chapter 1 and verse 15, there were 120 disciples in the upper room in the city of Jerusalem. 
waiting for the promise of the Father that was made to the apostles. As we continue on in the book of Acts, we find in chapter 2 that then to that 120, there is an additional about three or about 3,000 added to that number. But stay in the book of Acts, you find that in chapter 4, verse 4, there were about 5,000 men. And, and, and yet there's nothing sexist about this, but at that time, the men, the heads of the household, were usually the only ones named. And so there could conceivably have been up to 15,000 that would have been included in this number. What we see is the church expanding. What we see is the church growing. What we see is the Great Commission being carried out in the first century. In Acts 6 and verse 7, I tell you what now, uh, Luke, the writer of Acts, he just stops using numbers now and he just says the number multiplied. Many thousands in Acts 21 and verse 20. And we find in, in, that the gospel in Colossians 1 and verse 6 had reached all the world. That is the Mediterranean world. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, it had, been it had touched or been preached to every creature under heaven. Isn't that what the Great Commission was about? Preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16 and verse 15. It has been estimated by the close of the first century there were more than one million Christians in the world. That would have been about 6% of the world's population. And so what you find here is the book of Acts, as it were, in literally, it closed with thousands upon thousands of people <coughs> obeying the gospel and becoming Christians. But now this in and of itself is amazing. But I want you to consider something else that is, that is amazing about this. When you think about the first century Christians and their spread of Christianity, they did this without having Sundays off. You know, we, 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 we growing up in this country, this is something that we've been very accustomed to for most of our lives, that Sunday is a day that we're off from work. It's a day that we can get together and we can worship God as it's often prayed without the fear of molestation. They didn't have that in the first century. They didn't have Sundays off. They did not have laws that were favorable to Christians. They weren't able to have tax-exempt status for groups of Christians wherever they happened to be or laws that would favor the spread of Christianity. They didn't have this in the first century. Furthermore, they didn't have comfortable church buildings like we have that would shelter us from the weather. They would meet under trees. They would meet down by the river. They would meet in private homes wherever they could get together. These Christians met. They didn't have God-fearing political leaders. You know, we have to acknowledge that even though maybe things are going downhill quickly in this country, there are still those political leaders who acknowledge that they do have a passing faith in God. That wasn't the way that it was in the first century world when the Christians were, where Christians were being made at the number that they were. They didn't have access to complete Bibles. And we talk about having Bible studies. That's a wonderful thing. They didn't have access they couldn't say to a, uh, to, a con, uh, to a prospect that were trying to convert, hey, turn over to Acts chapter 22 and let me show you in verse 16 what to do to be saved. They couldn't do that. They didn't have complete Bibles. They didn't have religious books about Christ that you could go to any bookstore and find. They didn't have books detailing church growth, how to make a church grow. They didn't have schools of evangelism teaching young men how to become preachers. They didn't have radio, television, or internet. But I'll tell you what they did have. They did have severe persecution and opposition. They had that. So do you think about the spread of Christianity in the first century and that the book of Acts concludes in Acts 28 and verse 31 with Paul in the city of Rome awaiting trial because he had appealed to Caesar. And what was he doing? He was preaching the kingdom of heaven and teaching people about Christ. And this was in, in, in face of all of these adversities. But I'm going to return to what we suggested a moment ago. And that is that God intends for us to continue doing exactly what those Christians were doing. And so what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is continuing the story. 
And Acts chapter, Acts chapter 29 is our continuing the story. Well, let me ask you, how are we doing? How are we doing continuing that story? What's being written today about the Christians in the 21st century? If, if something by inspiration was being penned about the efforts that we're putting forth, how well would we be doing? Would we, as the passage that just flashed up on the screen a moment ago in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, would we be turning the world upside down? You know, that's what's said about those early Christians. You saw what was happening. And without all of these favorable things allowing it to happen, it was happening in spite of the opposition. It was happening in spite of the persecution. Well, have we picked up that banner, ladies and gentlemen? Let's be genuine about that. Have we really picked up the banner? What are we doing to continue the story? Well, I'm going to tell you something. In order to turn the world upside down, and this is the reality of it, in order to turn the world upside down, that gospel has first, and it first must turn us upside down. It's got to shake us up. It's got to make some drastic changes in our hearts and in our lives. In order for us to turn the world upside down, the gospel must first turn us upside down. That is, it must upset our views of Christianity. It must upset our views of other people. It must upset our views of the lost. Let me show you. Let me show you. We're just going to pick out some things out of the book of Acts. And I'm going to show you how those people got it done. I'm just going to look at some of the things that they did and show you why they turned the world upside down because they were turned upside down. If we're going to continue the story, we're going to have to emulate what they did to begin the story. If we're going to write chapter 29 as it were, we must see what they did in chapters 1 through 28 of the book of Acts. One of the first things that we notice is they were able to spread the gospel because they trusted in the great power of God to save. This is an amazing declaration. You know, in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus reminded the disciples that you will receive power. You will receive power. Now, He's promising to them that they would receive the miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive power. Remember back in Acts chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus told these apostles, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be led into all the truth. Now he says great power is going to come upon you. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, that power came upon them and they began by, that, by, by the Holy Spirit to preach as the Spirit gave them utterance as He was putting the words in their mouths. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking to you about the miraculous manifestations of the Spirit. I could point out to you that the Spirit provided them with the power to perform miracles to confirm the Word. But I'm going to tell you there's not one miracle in all the book of Acts that ever converted one person. It was not the miracles that were converting people. It was the words the Holy Spirit gave for in those words was the power of God to salvation. Romans 1 and verse 16, the gospel is God's power to save. This is why in Acts 2 and verse 14, Peter said to those who were lost in Jerusalem, hear my words. In verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Peter said in verse 40, uh, or Luke says in verse 40 of Acts 2, with many other words he testified and exhorted them, be saved from this perverse generation. They trusted in the power of the Word of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. They trusted in the power of the Word of God and they got busy spreading that Word. This is the great power that Acts 4 and verse 33 talks about. And with great power they witnessed to the resurrection of Jesus in the city of Jerusalem and elsewhere. They trusted in Now you contrast that with what we're doing in the 21st century as we continue the story. It won't do any good, J.R. 
People don't listen to the Bible anymore. They don't listen to the... It won't do any good to have meetings. It won't do any good to have Bible studies. It won't do any good. You see what's happened? We've allowed the Word of God, at least in our minds and in our hearts, to become impotent. Well, they didn't have that attitude. Their attitude was not, well, it won't do any good. Their attitude wasn't, well, you know, we, we need more than just simple Bible teaching. We need more than just simple Bible preaching. They didn't have that attitude. They preached the way. They, 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 they trusted in the power of God with great power. They went about converting men and women to the Lord. Churches today seem like in many places are trying everything in the world to reach people but the simple teaching of the Bible. Let's build cathedrals. And that will draw people and people will just naturally be drawn if we have a great cathedral with stained glass windows and all of these other things, why the people will just come and drove, really? Well, let's get. Uh, I tell you what, let's do. Let's get. Uh, let's get a, a a preacher that has a PhD and a big name preacher. And, and when people find out who's our preacher, they'll just come and drove, really. This is what we see in the first century. This is how those Christians grew in the first century. <laughs> Well, you know what, J.R., I'll tell you what we need to do. We, we need to have people who are more socially attuned. They need, we need the more socially elite people. If we could get the mayor and we could get the chief of police and we could get some entertainers and we could get some people that folks look up to, maybe we could go out here and get some of the Indianapolis Colts to start attending here. Well, people are going to come. That's not what we read about in the first. Matter of fact, Paul said there's not many mighty among us or among the Corinthians. That's not where it is. That's not what they did. They simply trusted in the power of God. As a matter of fact, in Acts 5 and verse 28, they were accused of filling Jerusalem with what? With the social elite? With what? The big name preacher? What were they filling Jerusalem with? Their big cathedral church buildings? What were they doing? No, they were filling Jerusalem with their teaching. That's what they were doing. You know, I'm going to tell you something. The big difference in my estimation between then and now is simply this. To them, Christianity was not a club. It was not a filler. To them, Christianity was not a social gathering. It was not about themselves. It was not about what can I get out of this. Christianity to them was about the Lord and they had a passion for Christ. They had a passion for what Jesus provided for them. And just, 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 just think about this. They think about what the early church was called. Do you, you ever stop and think about that? Well, you say, well, you know, we, well, yeah, the Church of God at Corinth, yeah. Well, yeah, it was called the Churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16, yeah. But do you know what it's called mostly in the book of Acts? It's called the way. The way. In Acts 9 and verse 1, it was Paul who was out to persecute the way. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't whet your appetite. That doesn't cause you wondering about that. It was called the way. Acts 18 verse 26, it was called the way of God. And do you know why it was called the way? And why it was called the way of God? I remember going back to Jesus in John 14 and verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It was called the way because they had a passion for the way. That is to Christ, that is of Christ Jesus. And they gave to the Lord their all. All their possessions. They gave to the Lord all their homes. They gave to the Lord all their families. They sometimes gave to the Lord all their jobs. And they sometimes were called upon to give the Lord all all their lives. That's the passion that they had. That's how they wrote the story. 
And as a result of that, Acts 6 and verse 7 says, Then the word of God spread. And the disciples multiplied greatly. How are we doing as we continue the story? But something else we find that they had going for them is they were bold. They were courageous in the face of all opposition. Do you ever notice what's said about the disciples in Acts chapter 4? Yes, it says they were ignorant and unlearned men. Yeah, you know, they had been with Jesus and that's all that they had going for them. There isn't any question about that. But one other, one other thing that says of them is that they were bold. Verse 13, Acts 4. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that these were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And then they realized that they had been with Jesus. And you read later on in that chapter. They were, in, you know, they were having a lot of things happen to them. But one of the things that they did when all of these things began to happen is in verse 29 it says of Acts chapter 4 they prayed to the Lord and said now Lord look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word and I want to tell you something my friends they had courage they were not afraid it was as though when they went out in the city of Jerusalem and preached, even though they'd been told, you know, keep your mouth shut, don't say another word. If you say another word about Jesus, we're going to put you in jail. And you know, that just, it, it, it almost, you, you read it, it almost sounds as though they said, well, you know, bring it on, we're going to preach. You're going to lose your job, bring it on, we're going to preach. Hey, you may, you, you may be eliminated from this, bring it on, we're going to preach. They had boldness. Now sometimes I grant you that this you know, opposition would cause somebody to become a little bit squeamish. And, and, and this may be why Paul in Ephesians 4 verses 18 and 19 reminded the Ephesians, hey, you pray for me. When these doors of opportunity open, you pray for me that I may have the boldness that I ought to have. And I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, they had it. Our culture, our generation, our society is so geared toward not offending someone that we have created a generation of cowards when it comes to spreading the gospel. We're afraid. And we need to read Revelation 21 and verse 8 that talks about the cowardly will not be included in heaven. The cowardly. That is, those who are timid. You know, sometimes we're, we're afraid to talk to family members. We may have a son or a daughter that's not living right. We may have an in-law that's not living right, a husband or a wife, mother or a father, and we're afraid to say anything to them. We're afraid we're going to upset them. We're afraid we're, they're going to get offended in what we're saying. You didn't read about that in the first century. Uh, as far as the first 28 chapters of the book of Acts were concerned, they were bold. I remember talking to an elder a number of years ago when I was living in another state. And he was telling me, well, really, we began talking about some of the trips that he and his wife were taking with a couple, uh, the man he used to work with in his secular employment. And, and I asked him, I asked this elder, I said, well, you know, I don't know those folks. Are, are they they're members of the church? No, no. He said, they're, they're, they're not members of the church. And he said, as a matter of fact, he said, we've been friends for many years. And he said, our friendship is too good to put a strain on it by talking about religion. So I don't want to do anything that strains that friendship so we don't bring up religion. Now, do you think that's the attitude those first century Christians had? Well, you know, I, I, got a, I got a friend over here that works for Felix, and I've got a friend over here that works for Agrippa, so I, I don't want to do anything to jeopardize that friendship. You think this was the attitude that they had? No. They were bold. Bring it on. We're going to tell you about the Lord. But we're raising our children to be afraid. That is to be afraid to be different. 
from children they go to school with. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4 that people in the world are going to view us as strange. They're going to think it's strange that you don't run with them to the same <laughs> excess of right. People are going to look at you and you don't do that? I think I've told you before when I was working, I was working for Ford Motor Company in Louisville. And there's a lot of guys that you know, I'd be associating with on, on the job and things like that. And sometimes after work, these fellows would want to go out and they'd want to stop by a neighborhood bar and they'd want to get some drinks and, and this, that, and the other. And they, they, they just love coming to me and inviting me to go with them. And I said, fellas, how many times am I going to have to tell you I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't do the other things that you do as far as your infidelity to your wives are concerned? I don't do that. And I had a fellow stand up to me one time and he said to me, he said, I'll tell you what, Bronger, he said, you, he said, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't run around with women. He said, one of these days you're going to lose your mind. You're going to go crazy. <laughs> well, I, I tell you something now. You know, a lot of times we don't want to be thought of as crazy. We don't want to be thought of as being odd and we don't want to be thought of as being different because we're afraid. We lack boldness. We don't want our children to be ostracized at school, so we'll allow them to participate in the Christmas programs. We don't want our children to be feeling out of place, and so we allow them to go to the prom and the dances and we'll allow them to go to the swimming pools because we don't want them to be different. May God grant us as we write chapter 29 some backbone, some courage, and some boldness. Yes, we're going to suffer persecution. All who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. But let me tell you something. Persecution never has been able to stamp out Christianity. Rome gave it its best shot. And Rome went down, not Christianity. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what destroys Christianity is cowardice, being timid, compromising, tolerating. This is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, be strong in the Lord. Be brave in the Lord. Did you ever notice how? Chapter 12 of the book of Acts opens. Verse 12, right, chapter 12 and verse 1 begins, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Well, you say, well, I can stand a little harassing. Read verse 2. That harassing included cutting the head off James the apostle. That harassing included throwing Peter in prison and they were intending to kill him. These brethren stood firm. They reached back and found a resolve of courage and commitment and boldness. Oh, by the way, you notice how verse 24 reads, but the Word of God grew and multiplied. That chapter begins with Herod harassing the church. It's contained with, it contains an account of the boldness of these Christians and it concludes with the church growing. You don't persecute the church out of existence. How are we doing? How are we doing writing chapter 29? Something else you learn about these people is they were successful by making dramatic changes in their lives. They understood what Paul wrote to the Corinthians and, 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 and encouraged them to remember and that is when you come become a Christian, you're in Christ, you become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Those early Christians understood what Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. You're raised to walk in newness of life. There was a change, a drastic 180 degree change that took place in their lives. You know, we've got to realize before anybody, I don't care who it is, a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a neighbor, a co-worker, a friend. It doesn't make any difference who it is. 
that person is not going to pay one dime's worth of attention to us about the gospel until they see what the gospel has done in our lives. Until they can see what the gospel has made of us and what we've become, they're not going to listen to a word that we say. They're looking to see if it changed us in our deeds, in our actions, in our speech, in our entertainment, in our relationships. They're going to look to see what changes have been made. Did it remove from us the things that needed to be removed? Did it create within us some things that needed to be created? Are we just the same old person having passed through some waters in a baptistry? Has the gospel really made some changes, really made some inroads in our lives? Has it really altered who we are? Have we really been raised to walk in newness of life? I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if it hasn't made I mean profound changes in our lives. We might as well find us a corner, sit down in it, keep our mouths shut because we're not going to influence one person to be saved. Those Christians in the first century, they made the great inroads as they did because people could look in their lives and they could see what changes had occurred. Yes, I know how you used to be. Paul said one time, you know, everybody in Jerusalem has known my manner of life. But now they see a difference. They see a change. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said, You put off concerning, verse 22, your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. He said, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put on that new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Has it made changes? Paul goes on to point out some of the changes that had occurred or needed to occur. Listen to what he says in verse 25. He says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Has your conversion put away lying? Has it put away deception? Has it put away duplicity? You know, I, I just, just think about that for a little bit. Well, what, how do I conduct business? Am I totally 100% honest in business even though I may know that my honesty will keep me from closing this deal? Speak the truth. That you speak the truth on your income tax. You speak the truth on your insurance claims. You speak the truth in everything that you're doing. But I've got, notice, notice what else he says. He said in verse 26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do I lash out at people? Does somebody make me angry and I just, I, I, I just, I, I'll take my tongue like a sword and I'll just verbally cut them to pieces? If I, if I live that kind of way, I might as well not try to convert a single soul to the Lord because the Gospel has not made an improvement in my life at all. Do I lose it? Do I seek revenge? Do I go home and just seethe in anger? I might as well, I might as well not try to teach anybody because I'm not writing a thing in the 29th chapter. Verse 28, Let him who stole steal no longer. You know, we talked about it a moment ago. Don't be, don't be defrauding the insurance company. Don't be defrauding the taxes. You know, we go through a go through a line at Lowe's and we pay for something and, 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 and they shortchange us, what, what are we going to say? Hey, you know, I, I give you a 20 and you give me change for a 10. I want, I want what's coming to me. But now if that's turned around, what do we do? If they give us change for a 20 when we actually gave them a 10, what do we do then? We say, hold on, you overpaid me. You don't, I don't deserve this. Or do we walk away saying, well, you know, that's their mistake, you know. Uh, they made the mistake. Uh, it's not my fault. Had a fellow that was a new car dealer one time. He asked me a question. He said, Preacher, I want you to explain to me. And he said, I'm talking about Christians here. He said, I want you to explain to me when, 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 when somebody buys from me a brand new car, 
and they order a CD player and it doesn't come with a CD player, only an AM FM radio, he said, why do they get on to me and demand that I give them a CD player? But then the same people, if they order a car with an AM FM radio and it happens to come with a CD player, they're okay with that and they don't want to pay for it. I said, I don't have an answer to that. But I have... Has the gospel cleaned up my life sufficiently that now I'm totally honest? Verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. Has my language been cleaned up? Is the way that I talk to my wife and the way that I talk to my children indicative of that clean up? language. You know, I've got to tell you, there are a lot of Christian men who speak to their wives in such a way that if they spoke to another man on the job that way, that other man would just beat them within an inch of their lives. But those poor Christian women suffer in silence because the gospel hasn't done for her husband what she hoped that it would do. If the gospel doesn't change you, no one is going to listen to anything that you say. I remember a young fellow one time coming to me, wanting, wanting me to give him some Bible verses how he could talk to his girlfriend about the church. She's a member of a denomination. He said, now, preacher, I'd like for you to give me some verses here that's going to help me in my teaching my girlfriend. Well, the time that we studied together and I started giving him some verses to help him in his study, and I come to find out that they were sleeping together. You mean to tell me you committed fornication with this girl, but you're concerned about her being a member of a denomination? Something's not calculating here. There's some disconnect here. You know, in Acts chapter, we mentioned this a moment ago, Acts chapter 9 opens with Saul of Tarsus, you know, breathing threats and murders against the Christians. He was out to persecute Christians. I mean, he was hauling them and putting them in jail. He was converted. He made a change in his life. But you know, people wouldn't trust him until they knew that change was real. Barnabas in verses 26 through 28 had to come to his defense. No, folks, he's really changed. And when they saw that, they trusted him. And that's the way it is with us. Unless people see changes in our lives, they're not going to trust anything we've got to say. They're not going to trust any, anything that we've got to offer. Those Christians in the first century, throughout the book of Acts, man, I tell you what, you look at their lives and there were a world of difference. This is the way they used to be. This is the way they are now. How are we doing? How are we doing in chapter 29 as the story continues? And then, those early Christians were successful because they reached out to all the lost, regardless of who they were. Regardless of the condition of their lives, they reached out to them. You know, Peter said by inspiration in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, and he didn't fully comprehend the profundity of his statement. But he said, you know, the gospel is not just for you, but for you and your children, to as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's the promise that had been made. It's, it's going to include everybody in the world. And those early Christians, they accepted that. And regardless of a person's color, regardless of a per person's ethnicity, and regardless of a person's sin, they took the gospel to that person. In Acts chapter 5, you, you, I mean, Acts chapter 8, rather, beginning in verse 5, you, you, you find that the gospel went down to the city of Samaria. Samaria was a hybrid group of people, the Samaritans were. They were hated by everybody. And yet the gospel reached them. And they obeyed, a good church was established in the city of Samaria. Because those people were not discriminated. You stay in Acts chapter 8 and you find, you find the gospel reaching an African. I tell you, when Philip joined the Ethiopian in the chariot, he didn't see the color of the man's skin. He saw the color of the man's soul and it was stained. And he took the gospel to him. 
Acts chapter 10, it went to the it went to Cornelius, to the to the Gentiles. It did stay in Jerusalem. You know, these people were, it went to Felix, it went to Agrippa, it went throughout the world. It went to people who were involved. They say, you know, today, today I, I'm afraid sometimes in, in, in our writing to this, we uh, in writing this continued story, we we, we arbitrarily decide that someone is unworthy of the Gospel. But when we decide that someone is unworthy of the Gospel, that, that we're, we're sinning. I'm not going to talk to him. He doesn't look like me. I'm not going to talk to her. She's a different color than I am. I'm not going to talk... Hey, I'm not going to talk to this, this person over here. Why, with somebody, that's a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to slam the door in their face. Well, it won't do any good to talk to him. He's been married three times. Why well, it's not going to do any good to talk to her. She's a lesbian. Really? This is the attitude that we ought to have when it comes to the God. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul said that some of the Corinthians were murderers, homosexuals, adulterers, fornicators. Gospel reached them. They made some changes. No, they didn't stay in that sin or those sins. They came out of those sins. Because the early Christians took the gospel to people regardless of their color, their ethnicity, or their sin. Well, somebody said, well, they won't listen. How do we know? How do we know? How do you know the neighbor who lives behind you won't listen to the gospel? How do you know the person that works with you won't listen to the gospel? Now, some may not, but you will not know that until you try to reach them with the Gospel. Paul was put in prison. As a matter of fact, historians say that he was actually literally chained to two guards on either side of him. And the guards were the elite. I'm telling you, they, they, they were, they, these guys, they were the Navy SEALs of the first century. They were Caesar's Praetorian, Praetorian Guard. And I mean, they were the elite. And so, you know, Paul could have looked at him and said, well, you know, my, all my work is done. I, I, I'm, I'm right here, I'm chained, I'm in prison, I can't... And, and I'm going to tell you, prison in Paul's day was a lot different than prisons today. Uh, Paul was dependent upon somebody coming and bringing him food. It wasn't he got three hots in a cot every day. It was, Paul was dependent upon somebody bringing him some uh, nourishment, some clothing, some warmth. You know, that's why he told Timothy, when you come, please bring the cloak before winter. Get here before winter. Because the jailers weren't going to do anything for him. But what did Paul do when he was chained to those guards? Well, you read Philippians 1 and it looks like he taught them the gospel. He taught those of Caesar's household the gospel of Christ. Because Paul recognized that the gospel is for all. All souls are precious to the Lord. How are we doing? Do we understand that the gospel is for the homeless as well as the billionaire? It's for the black as well as the white? It's for those who've been raised in good families as well as those who've been raised in bad families? Do we understand that? 21st century, Christians better be diligent in reaching out to the lost. That's the only reason why we exist as a local congregation. So, Acts 29. The story continues. How we do it. You know, there's a song that we sometimes sing, Christ has no hands but our hands to do His work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in the way. He has no tongue but our tongue to tell men how He died. He has no help but our help to bring men to His side. How we do it? Right. 29th chapter of the book of Acts. Maybe we need to do some serious, serious soul searching. Make some changes internally that will result in changes externally in our life. I tell you, I don't know about you, but I recognize I need to make some changes. Chances are you do too. Let's get serious about this thing.
called Christianity. And let me challenge you today that if you're not a Christian, you need to get serious about it right now. There's nothing more precious that you own than the soul that God has given to you. Don't exchange that for a few years of fleeting, passing pleasure upon this earth. Be serious. Commit your life to the Lord. Genuinely. Sincerely. If you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins. Turn from them. Confess your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He's now going to be the captain of your ship. And be baptized in water for the remission of your sins and do what? Be raised to walk in newness of life. And then you join with us in spreading the Gospel to as many as we can reach. If you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come right now? So together we stand.